Hi everybody, welcome back to MTRA Bedtime Stories. Well, Joel and Justin are headed back with two horses and they're headed back home. The chapter three title is Northward to Vermont. Here we go. They were scarcely out upon the high road when Master Morgan began teaching. Teaching was in his blood and he couldn't help giving lessons along the way. Joel, he announced in his first day of school voice, we have two new pupils with us and I am of a mind to make this a pleasant junker. If we swing along at a nice easy pace, we should reach the village of Chicopee before the sun is over our heads. That's where the little Chicopee River joins up with the big Connecticut. You remember how the Connecticut got its name, don't you, Joel? Joel nodded, but saying nothing as he led Ebenezer along and kept his eye on the, on the caperings of little Bub. He knew the answer well enough, but the way the schoolmaster told it made it more exciting. Boys, the teacher was saying, I want you to picture Indian braves shooting their boats over the rapids, calling out to each other, Quonek, Quonek, which means long, and Tuck, which means river. Joel could almost see the brown bodies like arrows flashing through the spray. Quontuck sounds fiercer and better than Connecticut, he offered. So it does, the schoolmaster chuckled. He turned from the boy and with a smile let his glance slide over the gangly cloaks. Now that's that. They were his, and he felt an inner squeeze of affection. He watched the dust rise from under their tiny feet as they pranced along. Ebenezer, little bub, he spoke quietly to them. We'll be crossing a covered bridge soon. You two ever been on a bridge? Likely not. But you'll admire the sound of your hoofs clattering over wood. See if you don't. The colts pricked their ears to take in the schoolmaster's voice. It had a soft huskiness that seemed part of the wind and the river. And the way he looked at them when he talked, it was as if they were all friends making a pilgrimage together. Along about twilight, the master went on. We should be near enough to Hadley Falls to feel the spray on our faces. We'll have a fine feast there. Joel and I will catch pike or perch while you two graze the delicious grass that grows on the banks. And it wouldn't surprise me, and if an obliging farmer would have a nose bag of corn or to trade, or the writing of a letter, or the chanting of a psalm, then we'll all bed down under the stars and let the music of the falls sing us to sleep. And so, with pleasant talk, the morning spent itself. Noontide found them crossing the bridge at Chicopee, just as the schoolmaster said they would. And by sundown, they were all in waiting below Hadley Falls. The man and the boy fishing for their supper, the colts rolling in the water, sudsing themselves clean. In the early mist of the next morn, they were on their way again. The road they traveled was no more than a path winding its way among trees Ever so often, the schoolmaster sat down on the ground and leaned against a tree to rest. This gave the colts a chance to eat the green shoots that came up through the forest duff and to scratch their itchy shoulders against the tree trunks. It gave Joel time to ease his bundle of clothes onto little Bub and acquaint him with the feeling of something on his back. Bub, he spoke quietly, we'll be crossing a covered bridge soon. One day, while going through the deep woods, they heard of the ring of axe strokes and the grunting of horses bent to the pole. Ebenezer whinnied to his fellow creatures. Then little Bub added a few high notes, which ended in a low rumble. Joel laughed, and when they came upon the men clearing the wilderness, he explained like some proud parent, That bulging you heard was our little Bub. He was trying to act like a grown-up horse. They paused well-tilled country too, wheat fields and fields of Indian corn with yellow squash planted between the rows. And they passed meadow land with horned cattle grazing. And one morning they met a train of ox carts. The very first driver pulled up to chat. Howdy folks, he said. 
smart big colt you got there. Then he pointed his whip toward little bub. But that runty one, he paused a moment, sizing him up more carefully. Nope, that little feller don't look like he'll amount to much. This was the first time a traveler compared the two colts, but it was not the last. Day after day, as they journeyed northward toward Vermont, their fellow travelers admired Ebenezer and scoffed at little bub. A cobbler who joined up with them for a mile or two even offered to buy the big colt and trade for his lapstone and all. But Master Morgan needed cobbler's tools even less than he needed a horse. Joel, the schoolmaster, admitted after he had turned down the offer, discouragement rides me. With one colt at heel and another running free, our return trip is slowed. Here it is almost pumpkin time and school begins in a month. How long will it take us? Three weeks? Four? The schoolmaster expected no answer and got none. He was talking as if to himself. The added responsibility seemed too weary to him. Anxious as he was to get home, he had to stop more and more often to rest in the shade. Joel, meanwhile, pulled burrs out of little bub's tail and mane, and then if Master Morgan's head nodded in his sleep, he began taking nonsense to little bub as if they were two boys with a secret all of their own. To his delight, the thing he longed for most was happening. The colt was answering in funny little wit. He's smart as a fox, Joel would tell the schoolmaster when he awoke. Knows lots of things. As the journey continued, Master Morgan had to agree that Bub was smart. Always it was the little code who first sensed the presence of a snake and warned the others with the rattling of his own breath. And always it was the little code whose ears first caught the faraway blowing of a conch shell calling men from the fields into dinner. The sound reminded him of Farmer Bean's place where mealtime for the family meant a handout for him, too. Turnip tops or carrot greens or even leftover apple john. Now far away from home, he was off like a bullet at the faintest sound of the conch shell. The others learned to follow eagerly, for his trail always led to a kitchen door where the air was spicy with the smell of gingerbread baking or the steaming fragrance of pork pie. There, the schoolmaster would remove his hat and sing in his soft, husky voice. So pilgrims on the scorching sand, beneath the burning sky, long for cooling stream at hand, and they must drink or die. Before he reached the second stanza, the doorstep swarmed with curious-eyed children. Look, Ma, the youngsters would shout to the mother, who now came out wiping her hands on her apron. See the colts, Ma? They've been singing, too. It was true. Whenever Master Morgan hit a high note, Ebenezer neighed and the little bub chimed in with a rumbling of obligato. This sent the children into peals of laughter. When the song was over, the farm wife would suddenly think of her baking and send her eldest in to mind it. Then she would insist that the master and the boy come into the kitchen for a good hot meal while the colts were turned out to pasture. As she watched her guests enjoy her cooking, she would compliment them. Oh, t'was a wonderful noise to listen to your hymn singing without its being the Sabbath day. Joel, of course, knows, Master Morgan replied, but I may as well tell you that I compose these anthems myself, and nothing pleasures me more than to sing them. There were days, however, when the schoolmaster did not sing at all, days when the wind churned the dust and set him to coughing. Then he walked more slowly, trying to quiet his spasms, sometimes steadying himself against the big colt. It was strange how Justin Morgan and Ebenezer drew together as the trip lengthened out. They both tired early, and they both seemed fearful of the wild animals that prowled by night. At the first sign of dust, their eyes probed the shadows for catamounts and wolves, and Ebenezer's nostrils flared to catch their scent. Time to build a fire and bed down, Master Morgan would say, yet neither the man nor the big colt could sleep. The man sat up cross-legged, elbows on knees, head resting in his hands, while nearby the colt dozed standing up. The smallest sound startled them, an acorn falling on dry leaves, the pit-a-pat of rabbit feet, and whimpering of an owl. Joel and Bub, however, were lulled by the soft voices of night. The little colt laid stretched out on his side, and gradually the boy edged nearer and nearer until soon he was curled, snug against the colt's back, 
It felt warm and furry, and Bub didn't seem to mind at all. Morning found them both eager and ready for new adventure, rain or hot sunshine beating down on their heads. Steep trails, skimpy food, nothing discouraged them. It was Joel and Bub who set the pace, and Ebenezer and the schoolmaster who lagged behind. But one noon day, a third of the way home, the schoolmaster was suddenly a man transformed. They had crossed the state line into Vermont, and almost miraculously, he seemed to gain new strength from the familiar green hills. He could not stop talking about them. Boys, he rejoiced, as he called his pupils to a halt. Vermont is named for its mountains, vert for green and mont for mountain. He straightened up to his full height and took off his hat in salute. Our first settlers made a grand ceremony of the christening, he said, a light of pride in his eye. They climbed Mount Pisgah right on over yonder, and from that lofty eminence they looked around about. What they saw pleased them. Hills peopled with deer, and down below in the valleys, a carpet of green thread with silver streams and rushing brooks. Joel sighed. He wished he could find the right words, too, for the things he felt. He half closed his eyes so that he could see the little company of pioneers climbing out Mount Pisgah. He tried to make believe the schoolmaster's voice beyond belonged to one of them. We are met here upon this mount the teacher was reciting, which is part of the spine of America, which holds together the terrestrial ball and divides the Atlantic Ocean from the Pacific. We are met here, gentlemen, to dedicate the wilderness to God and to give it a worthy name. That name shall be Vermont, in token that her mountains and hills shall ever green and shall never die. The boy put his arm around little Bub's neck, listening to the husky voice as it now quoted from the Bible. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Joel knew what the next words would be, and in his mind he was riding on Bub's back, riding into the hills. From whence cometh my help? He sang joyously in chorus with the schoolmaster. And that ends our chapter tonight. So... Happily, they've made it safely back to Vermont. We'll wait to see what happens tomorrow. Okay, everybody, get a good night's sleep. Be safe, be kind, and I'll meet you here tomorrow night.